Welcome back for the final episode of our unique series on The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, translated by Michael Morpurgo. We are thrilled to welcome Tom Burke today to read along with Michael. Tom, we are absolutely delighted to have you. We also have the privilege of welcoming the great nephew of Saint-Exupéry, Monsieur Olivier Daguet, who will give us additional insight on Antoine de Saint-Exupéry himself, led this whole discussion by Nihal Arthanyaka. Quite an emotional last episode, I believe. So, so we won't say much more. Don't forget, you can watch all the episodes on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Thank you for being with us. You have been more than 100,000 to follow us on this exceptional adventure. When the time is right, we hope to gather the cast for a live reading with a live audience here on stage. Make sure you stay tuned to hear more about the next step to this great event. Nihal? Thank you very much, Raphael. Thank you, Lynn, as well. And uh, welcome. Watching it on Facebook, on Instagram Live, and um, yeah, it's a really, and YouTube, of course, as well. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Olivier, thank you as well. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Tom and Olivier, of course. Uh, we're going to be reading the chapters, and then we've got a really special selection of letters that we are going to be reading out both in French. This is the first this week, Michael, isn't it? We're going to have to actually have someone speaking French. Absolutely. And put on by Institut Francais. The, the irony is not... Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> it would be brilliant. It would be remiss of us, in fact, to go through this whole week and not have someone doing French. So, without any further ado, it is time now. We will start with Chapter 23. We'll take off where we left off yesterday of The Little Prince. Michael, over to you. Chapter 23. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the shopkeeper. His shop sold pills that were guaranteed to take away your thirst. Pills you only needed once a week, which meant you no longer needed to drink at all. But what's the point of selling them? Asked the little prince. It saves people time, lots of time, replied the shopkeeper. Experts have worked it all out. People save 53 minutes a week. Um, but what, what do they do with their 53 saved minutes? Whatever they like. Well, said the little prince, if I had those 53 minutes to spend as I wanted, I think I'd go off for a nice walk and find myself a spring of lovely fresh water and have a good drink. Chapter 24. It was the eighth day after my plane came down in the desert. And as I listened to the little prince telling the story about the shopkeeper, I found I was drinking my very last drop of water. Your memories are fascinating, I told the little prince, but the trouble is that I still have not repaired my plane and now I have nothing at all left to drink. I'm telling you, it would make me very happy indeed if I could go off for a nice walk and find myself a spring of lovely fresh water and have a good drink. My friend the fox, the little prince began, my dear friend, please, no more about the fox. Why not? Because I am about to die of thirst. Well, he said, clearly not understanding what I meant at all. I think it's a very good thing to have a friend, especially if you're going to die. And as for me, I'm very grateful to have had a fox for a friend. All I could think was this. This fellow simply does not realize the danger I am in. He has never been this hungry or this thirsty. A little more of this sun, and he will soon find out what it is like. He looked at me then, and must have known at once what I was thinking. I'm also thirsty, he said. Let's go and find a well. I could only shrug wearily as I agreed. I knew it was quite hopeless and absurd to think you could find a well out there in the immensity of the desert. But anyway, off we went. 
We trudged on in silence for hours and hours. Night fell, the stars came out. I saw them as if I were in a dream. I was feverish, I think, because I had become so thirsty. The words of the little prince echoed in my mind. So you're thirsty as well, are you? I asked him, but he did not reply. All he said was, water can be really good for the spirits. I didn't understand this, but I said no more. I knew well enough by now not to question him too closely. He was tired. He sat down, and I sat down beside him. After some moments of silence, he spoke again. All the stars are beautiful. And that's because of just one flower you cannot even see. That's true enough, I replied. And saying no more, I looked out over the waves of sand under the light of the moon. The desert is so beautiful, the little prince said, and it was true. I have always loved the desert. Sitting on a sand dune, there is nothing to see, nothing to hear, and yet the silence out there seems to glow, to radiate. What makes the desert so special, said the little prince, is that somewhere out there is a well, a well that is hiding from us. And to my amazement, I suddenly understood this mysterious silence of the desert. When I was a small boy, I used to live in an old house. There were stories of buried treasure in this house. Of course, no one had ever found any, nor had anyone probably even looked for it. But that story brought a mysterious enchantment to that whole house. My house was hiding a secret deep in its heart. Yes, I said to the little prince, whether we are thinking of a house or the stars or the desert, what makes them beautiful is always invisible. I'm so pleased said the little prince, that you agree with my fox. Once the little prince fell asleep, I picked him up in my arms and set off on my way again. I was so moved as I walked. It seemed to me I was carrying in my arms the most delicate of treasures, that there could be nothing more fragile on the whole earth. In the light of the moon, I looked down at this pale forehead, those closed eyes, those locks of his that trembled in the wind. What I am seeing, I thought, is no more than the shell. What is truly important, I cannot see. His lips were open just slightly, as if half smiling. What moves me most about this little prince asleep in my arms is his love and loyalty for a flower. And it is the rose in him that radiates like a lamplight, even when he sleeps. He seemed to me at that moment more delicate and precious than ever. Lamplight has to be protected. One gust of wind is all it takes to blow it out. I walked on until at dawn I came upon a well. Chapter 25 People, said the little prince, they roar along in express trains without ever knowing what they are looking for. They rush about, go round and round in circles, and none of it's worth the trouble. The well we had arrived at did not look much like a well you might find in the deserts of the Sahara. Wells in the Sahara are no more than holes in the sand. This one was more like a village well, but there was no village. I thought I must be dreaming. This is really odd, I said to the little prince. Look, 
Everything is ready and waiting for us. The pulley, the bucket, the rope. He laughed, grabbed the rope and began to pull. The pulley groaned like an old weather vane that had long since been forgotten by the wind. Do you hear that? said the little prince. We are waking up this well. He is singing to us. I did not want him to have to do the pulling and tie himself. Let me do it, I told him. It's too heavy for you. Slowly, slowly, I hoisted the bucket up to the top of the well, and there I set it down, carefully balancing it on the edge. It was heavy, and I was exhausted. But I was also rather pleased with myself. The song of the pulley echoed on in my ears, and I could see sunlight shimmering on the water and the water still trembling. I'm dying for that water, said the little prince. I need a drink right now. I knew what he meant. I lifted the bucket to his lips. He drank, his eyes closed. Then I drank. It was like a feast of water. This was not ordinary food, of course, but it might just as well have been. The sweetness of this water was born from the long walk under the stars, from the song of the pulley, and from the effort of pulling up that bucket. It made me feel good, it made me happy, as a present does. When I was a little boy, the Christmas tree lights, the music at midnight mass, the sweet smiles all around me, they shone light and warmth on any Christmas present I was given. It was like that. People here on earth where you live, said the little prince, might grow 5,000 rose, roses in the same garden, and yet they cannot find what they are looking for. You're right, I replied. <laughs> they never find it. And yet it can be found in one single rose or in a drink of water. That is true, I said. Eyes are blind, the little prince went on. To see things as they are, you have to use your heart. I had drunk my fill. I was breathing more easily now. At sunrise, sand is the color of honey. The sight of it filled me with happiness. So why was I feeling sad at heart? You have to keep your promise, you know, said the little prince, who spoke quietly to me as he sat down beside me. What promise do you mean? You know, the muzzle for my sheep. I am responsible for that flower of mine. I took out my sketchbook. The little prince looked through my drawings and laughed out loud. Your baobabs, they look a little like cabbages to me. Cabbages? I was rather proud of my baobab drawings. And as for your fox, his ears, well, they look like horns. They're far too long. And he laughed again. That's not fair, my dear fellow, I said. I can only really draw boa constrictors, boa constrictors from the inside or from the outside. Don't worry, he said. Children understand these things. So I drew a muzzle for him. But as I was handing it over, a deep sense of foreboding came over me like a shadow. Have you got plans you're not telling me about? I asked him, but there was nothing in reply. Tomorrow, he said, will be the anniversary of my arrival on earth. Then after a moment of silence, he went on. I landed quite close to here. He flushed suddenly as if he was hiding something. And once more, without understanding why, I felt overwhelmed by sorrow. And this was when a sudden thought came to mind. So it wasn't just by chance that on the morning I first met you a week ago now, I found you wandering about all alone, a thousand miles from any human habitation. You were on your way back to the very place where you first landed on Earth, weren't you? Now the little prince was looking even more flushed. I was unsure for a moment whether to go on. 
was it perhaps, I said, because of the anniversary? The little prince flushed again with embarrassment. He never answered questions directly, of course, but when people flush like this, it usually means yes. I'm afraid I have upset you, I began, but he interrupted me. You must get on with your work, he said. You had best get back to your engine. I will wait here for you. Come back tomorrow evening. This did not set my mind at rest at all. I remembered the fox. If you allow yourself to be tamed, there will be tears. Chapter 26. Right beside the well, there were the ruins of an old stone wall. When I came back from my work on the engine the next evening, I saw my little prince from far away. He was sitting high up there on the wall, his legs dangling. I could hear him talking to someone. You don't remember then, he was saying. So it wasn't here at all. Another voice I couldn't hear must have replied because the little prince was answering it. Yes. Yes, I, I know it's the right day, but this is not the right place. I came closer to the wall. I could not see or hear anyone else. Yet the little prince was answering someone yet again. All right, you will see where my tracks begin in the sand. All you have to do is follow them and then wait for me there. I will be there tonight. By this time, I was 20 meters from the wall and still I could, not, I could see no one. After a few moments of silence, the little prince spoke again. Is your venom good? Are you sure it won't make me suffer for too long? I stopped where I was, my heart in my mouth. I still could not fully grasp what was going on. Now just go away, will you? said the little prince. I want to get down off this wall. That was when I spotted something at the foot of the wall, something that made, my, made me start back in terror. There, with his eyes fixed on the little prince, was one of those yellow snakes that can kill you in 30 seconds. I was groping in my pocket for my revolver as I backed away. I began to run, but I must have made too much noise because the snake slipped into the sand, flowed away like a stream of dying water, seemingly in no hurry at all, disappearing between the stones with just a hint of sounds, almost metallic. I reached the wall just in time to catch my little prince in my arms. He was as pale as a sheet. What does this mean? I cried. Why are you talking to snakes? I was taking off the golden scarf he always wore, cooling his temples with water, making him drink. But I didn't dare ask him any more questions. He looked up at me, his eyes full of sorrow, and then wrapped his arms around my neck. I felt the beating of his heart. It was like the heart of a dying bird that had been shot. I am so pleased you have found what was wrong with your engine, he said. Now you will be able to go back home. But how did you know, I asked. It was what I had come for, to break the good news to him that against all expectations I had indeed managed to repair my engine. He did not say a word in reply to my question. Me too, he said. I'm going. Me too, he said. I'm going home today as well. Then, more sadly, he went on. It is a long, long way that I am going. It will be a difficult journey. Very difficult. I knew that something quite extraordinary was happening. I was holding him in my arms like a little child, for it seemed to me that he was drifting away from me and falling down, down into an abyss, and that there was nothing I could do to save him. He looked already like someone lost and far away. I have your sheep, he said. And I have his box, too, and the muzzle. He smiled, sadly. I waited a while, holding him, and he began to revive. 
to feel better little by little. My dear fellow, I said, you must have been so frightened. And he certainly had been terrified. But he just laughed softly and said, I think I shall be much more frightened this evening. And again, I felt a chill come over me at the thought that there was nothing more to be done. And I knew I could not bear the idea that I would never hear the sound of his laughter again. For me, it was like a spring of fresh water in the desert. Dear little fellow, I said, I should love to hear you laugh again. But all he said was, tonight it will be one year and my star will be right above the place where I came down to earth this time last year. Dear little fellow, please tell me this whole thing is just a bad dream. This story of the star and your meeting with the snake, it's not true, is it? But he didn't reply to my question. Instead, he said, What's, what's truly important is always what you cannot see. I know that. It's the same with the flower. If you love a flower growing on a star, it is wonderful at night to gaze up at the sky. Then all the stars will be aglow with flowers. They are. They are. It is the same with water. The water you gave me to drink was like music because of the pulley and the rope. You remember? It was so good. It was. It was. At night times, you will gaze up at the stars, said the little prince. Where I live is too small for me to even show you where you will find my star. It is better that way. My star for you will be just one of the stars up there. Think of it like this, and you will love to look up and wonder at all the stars. They will all be your friends. And now I'm going to give you a present. And he laughed again. Oh, my dear little fellow, my dear little prince, how I love to hear that laugh of yours. And that's my present to you. It will be just like it was when we drank the water. What do you mean? Stars mean different things to different people. For travelers, stars tell them where they are, where they are going. For others, they are just little lights in the sky. For scholars, they are the world of the unknown, yet to be discovered and understood. For my businessmen, they are gold. But all stars stay silent. A and you? No one else in the world will see the stars as you do. I don't understand exactly. When you look up at the sky at night, because I live in one of them, because I will be laughing in one of them, for you it will be as if all the stars are laughing. For you and only for you, the stars will always be laughing and the little prince was laughing again. And once you have got over the sadness of parting, and in time we always do, you will be happy that you knew me you will always be my friend. You will always want to laugh with me. Sometimes you will open your window just for the pure pleasure of it and look out. And when you do, all your friends will be so astonished to see you looking up at the sky and laughing. You'll say, stars, you know, they always make me laugh. And they'll think you're quite mad. And you will think I have played a mean sort of trick on you. And he laughed again. It'll be as if I'd given you instead of the stars, thousands of little bells up there, all ringing with their laughter. He laughed and laughed, but then suddenly turned very solemn. Tonight I think it will be better if you don't come. I won't leave you, I said. I will look as if I am suffering, said the little prince. I may even look as if I am dying. It is how it will be. 
Don't come to see that. It's not worth it. I don't want to leave you, I said. He looked suddenly worried. I'm telling you not to come also because of the snake. I don't, I don't want him to bite you. They are nasty, vicious creatures. They can bite just for the fun of it. I tell you, I'm not going to leave you alone, I said. Of course, he began more reassured now. Of course, it is true that they don't have much venom left for a second bite. That night, I did not see him leave. The little prince slipped off so silently that I never knew anything. When I finally caught up with him, he was walking fast, striding out. Ah, there you are, was all he said. When he took me by the hand, I could feel he was still deeply troubled. You were wrong to come. You will be grieving. It will look as if I am dead, and it will not be true. I could not say anything. You understand. It is too far. I can't take this body of mine with me. It is too heavy. Still, I said nothing. It will be like an old empty shell left lying there on the ground. There's nothing sad about an old shell. What could I say? He was losing heart, but he went on anyway. It will be all right, you know. I shall look up at the stars too. All the stars will be wells with a rusty pulley. So all the stars will pour out their fresh water for me to drink. I said nothing. It will be such fun. You will have 500 million bells and I will have 500 million wells. Now he too said no more because he was crying. We are almost there, he said. I'll go on alone now. But then he sat down. I could see he was frightened. My flower. I am responsible for her, you know, he said. And she is so fragile and innocent. She has only four thorns, that's all, to protect herself against the world. I sat down nearby. I could no longer stand up. Well, the little prince said, I suppose the time has come. For a moment or two, he waited. Then he stood up and began to walk away. I could not move. It was no more than a flash of yellow close to his ankle. For a moment, he stood quite still. He did not cry out. He fell slowly as a tree falls. There was no sound at all because he fell on sand. Chapter 27. It has been six years now and I have never before told this my story. Friends who saw me afterwards were delighted to see me alive. I must have seemed rather sad. I am just tired, I told them. Now I am a little bit happier, or perhaps a little less sad. But I do know for sure that the little prince went back to his planet because when daylight came, I could not find his body. So it wasn't such a heavy body after all. And I loved to go out at night and listen to the stars. They do ring like 500 million bells. But there is something else that occurred to me that I must tell you. I remember that on the muzzle I drew for the little prince, I forgot to draw a leather strap. 
Without a strap there was, of course, no way to keep the muzzle on. So now I keep wondering what is happening up there on his planet. Might the sheep have eaten the flower? But I tell myself, no, surely not. Every night the little prince covers his flower under his glass cloche, and he always keeps a watchful eye on his sheep. And then I am happy enough. And the stars laugh so sweetly up there above me. But then I keep thinking how easy it is to become distracted from time to time. That's all it would take. Maybe one evening he will forget to cover his flower with a cloche, and maybe the sheep will steal away silently in the middle of the night. Then all the bells up there would turn to tears. It is all a great mystery, isn't it? For you who love the little prince, as I do, nothing in the universe makes any sense at all, unless somewhere, and who knows where, some unseen sheep has or has not eaten a rose. Look up at the sky, ask yourself, is it yes or no? Has the sheep eaten the flower, yes or no? Do it, and you will see how everything changes. And no grown-up will ever understand just how important that is. This, for me, is the most beautiful and the saddest landscape in the whole world. It's the same as the one on the opposite page. I have drawn it once more, just so you don't forget it. This is where the little prince appeared on earth and then disappeared. Look carefully so that you will recognize it if ever your travels take you one day to the deserts of Africa. And if you do happen to pass that way, don't hurry on, but instead wait for a while right under the star. And if a little fellow comes along, if he laughs, if he has golden hair, and if he never answers questions, then you will know who it is. If that happens, please be good enough to write to me at once. It would be of such comfort to me to know that he has come back. That was extraordinary. Tom, that was, yeah, okay. We'll, 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 we shall start with Olivier. Can I ask you, because we're about to go into some letters, but, but before that, I'd like to ask you your emotional reaction to hearing what you've just heard, the reading by Tom Burke and Michael. I have no words. It was extraordinary. I think for anybody watching, whether you're watching on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, really was perfect. They really touched us. Yes. Deeply. Without a doubt. Um, we are going to now, Olivier, uh, just introduce you again, Olivier Daguet, the great nephew of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, but also the Delegate General of the Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Youth Foundation is here with us. And, and we're very honoured to have you here, Olivier, so thank you very much for coming. We're about to hear from both you and from Tom letters that um, your great uncle wrote. Can you explain to us why these letters are important? It's actually one letter, I should say. Letter is important in understanding what we've just heard. Well, we have to explain the context that um, we are in 1944, 
um, February, mostly. And Saint Exupéry uh, has left New York a few months ago, where he spent three years, very fruitful period for him, uh, because he wrote four books during this period, including The Little Prince. But his only wish was to go back to the war and to participate. He's not just an intellectual, he's, he's a man of action. So he wants to go back to the war and thanks to the, his American friends, he has the opportunity to go back uh, in April 1943 uh, in North Africa. North Africa, the desert, where well, it's very close to the Little Prince story. And uh, then he's back to his squadron and they are moving toward the, the target. The target is France, of course. So they are moving from North Africa to Sicilia, Corsica, you know, and he's doing mission. Uh, this time is very, uh, very tough, very tough for him. Uh, he feels very desperate, very lonely, very sad, uh, because um, the spectacle uh, he can see in, uh, in, in Algier, uh, politically wise, you know, is, is, is not according to his expectations. He's very disappointed by the, by the goal, by all the politicians. Uh, he feels like uh, nobody understands him. And he's writing this letter, letter to X. We have chosen this letter uh, to his, her, his friend, Nelly de Vaugue. And this friend is a fantastic woman, French woman, um, businesswoman, uh, very brilliant intellectually speaking. And um, she's more than a friend. They are connected, intellectually connected on a very high level. And at this time, Saint-Exupéry has moved to a top level of reflection and philosophy. You know, his niche is uh, Zarathustra. you know, is, is really over everything, um, even Little Prince, you know. And, and he's, uh, he knows that he will die in this war because he's doing very, very perilous missions. Uh, he's very old, he's, he's far too old to, to pilot this it's the speedest plane of the, of, uh, of the war, uh, the P-38 Lightning. So, uh, but he, he has been supported by um, General Eisenhower to, to be allowed to pilot this plane and doing mission. Because he, want, he wants to commit, he wants to, 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 see, to, to show to the, to the guys that he's not only an intellectual, but also a man of action. So he's like Little Prince, you know, feeling like Little Prince before the, the snakes bite, you know. Little Prince is doubting, he's, he's terrified, you know. And like um, Jesus Christ uh, asking to his father, 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 why did you abandon me? And it's, it's really the spirit of this letter. It's very dark and sad, but it's beautiful. So can we start, Olivier, with you reading the first text in French and then Tom? Um, is that okay? Tom, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Tom will be in English, and we will go straight through, and then afterwards, Michael, we will bring you back in, and we shall have a conversation. Olivier? So we have four different extracts from this letter, okay? So I read in French. Je ne puis pas supporter cette époque. Je ne le puis pas. Tout s'est aggravé. Il fait nuit dans la tête et froid dans le cœur. Tout est médiocre. Tout est laid. Je leur reproche une chose avant tout, c'est de ne pas fonder l'allégresse. C'est de ne pas solliciter les dons. C'est de ne rien tirer des hommes. Le censeur sinistre d'un mauvais collège, voilà ce qu'ils ont apporté. Ils sont en moi comme une maladie, c'est très étrange. Je n'ai jamais, jamais été aussi seul au monde, j'ai comme un chagrin inconsolable. I cannot stand this age. Everything has got worse. The mind gropes in darkness and the heart is frozen. Everything is mediocre. Everything is ugly. I reproach them for one thing above all, 
They don't inspire joy. They don't bring out talent. They don't draw anything out of people. All they have introduced is something like a sinister proctor in a second-rate school. They are like a sickness inside me. It's strange. Never in all my life have I felt so alone. It's like an inconsolable grief. J'ai du chagrin à perdre haleine. Je me suis dit ça tout doucement comme si c'était poétique. Je voudrais bien me plaindre un petit peu. C'est vrai ce que j'ai écrit de la Libye. Au dernier petit jour, quand les parachutes étaient secs et que je croyais qu'il fallait mourir, je me suis consolé dix minutes durant, sans bouger, avec une seule phrase qui me semblait extraordinairement rayonnante. Il y a ici un cœur sec, un cœur sec, un cœur sec qui ne s'est pas formé de larmes. Et j'ai essayé de me consoler ainsi des temps présents, en me disant tout doucement, roulé dans mon lit, pour m'y endormir, j'ai du chagrin à perdre haleine. Et ces phrases-là, c'est comme des poissons chinois. Une fois hors de l'eau, ils ne ressemblent plus à rien. Ainsi, hors du rêve. Et cependant, c'est vrai, j'ai du chagrin à perdre haleine. Grief takes my breath away. I said that softly to myself as if it were poetry. I want to complain a little. What I wrote about Libya is true. On the morning of the last day when the parachutes were dry and I thought that I was going to die, I consoled myself for 10 minutes without moving by repeating a sentence that seemed radiant to me. Here is a dried out heart a dried out heart that cannot produce tears. And now I try to console myself for the present by repeating softly to myself as I lay curled up in bed, trying to get to sleep, grief takes my breath away. But such phrases are like Chinese fish. Once out of the water, they no longer resemble anything. And so it is outside of dreams. And so it is outside of dreams. Nevertheless, it's true. Grief takes my breath away. C'est très curieux. J'ai pensé à la prison. J'étais allongé et j'imaginais. J'imaginais tel ou tel tour de carte qui me permettait l'évasion. On agit comme ci si, et comme ça, et le tour est joué. Cependant, si cette tuile m'échoue, je ne m'évaderai certes pas. Je ne subirai pas, du moins j'en ai l'impression, cette impulsion. Ça se boit jusqu'au bout. L'évadé est hors son destin et n'existe plus nulle part. C'est pas sérieux. Curiously, I thought of prison. I was stretched out and amusing, trying to think of a card trick that would enable me to make good my escape. One does this and that, and the trick is done. But should this ill luck befall me, I will certainly not escape. I don't think I'll feel any urge to do so. One bears it to the bitter end. The escaped convict is outside his destiny and exists nowhere. He's ceased to count. Il paraît que l'on me cherche pour me remettre une lettre de vous. J'essaye de retrouver le porteur. J'ai pensé plusieurs choses. Il est tout de même tout à fait extraordinaire, vu de Sirius, que le climat intérieur soit changé par une lettre. C'est tout à fait analogue à la musique. On vous installe dans du Jean-Sébastien Bach et votre comportement est changé. Votre mort même, si elle doit survenir alors, prend une valeur différente ou votre acte, ou votre misère. Extraordinaire valeur du témoignage, c'est très étrange. Au fond, je suis reconnu par Jean-Sébastien Bach quand il me parle. Et l'autre jour m'est venue une lettre qui m'a touché. J'étais reconnu par qui m'écrivait. 
et cette lettre eût été plus forte que la prison. Son rayonnement eût effacé la prison. Cependant, il ne s'agissait point là de quelqu'un pour qui je me ferais tuer, mais cette personne prenait une sorte d'importance universelle. Dieu menaçait, sans doute, à travers. Et à travers l'autre qui m'écrit de Bach, Dieu qui est, simplement. Car Bach eut réussi ce que cette lettre a réussi. Ce n'est pas absolument différent, et bien sûr, il me semble que tel qui m'a écrit, je ne puis pas vivre sans elle. Mais tel autre qui m'écrirait, je ne pourrais pas non plus vivre sans elle. Je me dis aussitôt, là est ma soif, parce que là je suis abreuvé. Mais si c'était Bach, ou telle vieille chanson du XVe siècle, je me dirais aussi, là est ma soif. Et en fin de compte, ma soif va au travers d'elle toutes et de tous et de tous les bacs vers une même commune mesure essentielle dont je ne sais rien saisir. It seems that I'm being looked for so that one of your letters can be given to me. I'm trying to find the messenger. I've thought of several things. It's very curious, seen from Sirius, that one's inner climate should be transformed by a letter. This happens in music. One is steeped in Bach and one's behavior changes. If one were to die, then one's death would take on another dimension or one's action or one's misery. The extraordinary value of witness is very strange. In fact, I am acknowledged by Johann Sebastian Bach when he speaks to me. The other day I received a letter that touched me. I was acknowledged by my correspondent, and that letter would have been more powerful than any prison wall. Its radiance would have melted any prison. The letter was not written by someone for whom I would readily die. Nevertheless, this person took on a sort of universal importance. And God is threatened thereby, and threatened by another correspondent who writes to me about Bach. God, who simply is. Bach would have achieved what this letter has achieved. It's not really very different. And of course, it seems to me that I can no longer live without her. But if another were to write to me, I should be equally unable to live without her. I say to myself immediately, there is my thirst, because there is where it is quenched. But if it were Bach or an old 15th century song, I would also say, there is my thirst. In the end, my thirst reaches out through all of them and all Bachs toward an essential common denominator that I cannot perceive. Thank you. Olivier and Tom, for the reading of the letters of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Um, Olivier, how do you think Antoine de Saint-Exupéry managed to square the circle of a man who is, who thinks deeply, is philosophical, he cares deeply, but yet he wants to join a war created by men of simple ideas. It seems almost paradoxical that he would wish to involve himself in something that was so base, su such savagery for a man of such beauty. Yes, because he, he wouldn't consider himself as an exception. He wouldn't consider himself no matter what he th really thinks and feel, as you say, but of course he's not an absolute fan of war, but he knows, he knows he has to, to, to behave like his fellows, you know, citizens and, and like any human. So it's not because he's an intellectual and a poet and, and, uh, and a very famous person uh, that he, 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 he should escape to this fate. And so he has to go to the war. So he chooses, he chooses the, the, the plane uh, and to be in the reconnaissance, not to kill people, not to bomb people. Okay. So he's, uh, he's in reconnaissance. But uh, anyway, he has to, 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 to be part of it. And, and there's no other way for him to, to be um, 
to be acknowledged, acknowledged by, by his friends and by the other. There is, there is a, a absolute necessity for him to be acknowledged by women, by his friend, by, by his, his, his uh, citizens, fellow citizens. So, so for him, there's no, no way, no, no, no doubt. He has to, to, to be in the war. He has to, to be as a soldier. He's a good, good fellow soldier. Um, you know, he's very um, proud, proud to be in the army and to be in the French army and, and the American army, the Air Force. And, and um, yeah, he, he knows that uh, what is at stake is the the, the 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 strike against uh, the Nazis, you know, is is look is striking for for civilization for the sake of civilization. So it's it's quite a big challenge here. Of course, it is. Michael, can I ask you your reaction to listening to Tom read chapters twenty six and twenty seven? Um, you can ask, but I find it quite difficult to respond without. Um, Without welling up, I thought it was extraordinary. He he um he lost himself totally um, in that relationship between the two of them and the place and what was happening and what he knew was going to happen. Um, it is that wonderful thing that literature can do, great literature can do, and indeed great actors can do, um, which is to strip away everything except the moment that you're living in. Um, yes, it's off the page, but it came off the page and joined uh, Tom, and Tom joined it to us. It's the most extraordinary to witness the power of, of great acting and great writing going together. It was wonderful. So thank you, Tom. But I don't particularly thank you because I had to follow you. <laughs> That's not, not, not easy. And Tom, I Last, obviously, but definitely not least, I need to ask you that question as well about where it took you. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, Shakespeare has this kind of effect and this universality to it. And, and Sis Berry, who was really the kind of matriarch of voice at the RSC for a, for a long time, used to talk about... Um, let the words do something to you, don't do something to the words. And it, it, the, the better the writing, the more easy it is to do that. Um, sometimes you have to work hard to get to that place. Because um, really you want to be in that place as much as possible. But, um, but, but with, with, with great writing, it's uh, a friend of mine, uh, we, 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 I talked about it dropping. I talked about dropping to zero. She talked about it being the hollow bone. You let yourself be a hollow bone, and um, but you know it's you don't have to try with us. I mean, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I've been reading it this morning just before we did a test zoom, and I, you know, I came on. And I was like, I, don't know. <laughs> I just, you know, hoped it wouldn't stop me too much because it, 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 it's a very overwhelming uh, scene as well. Yeah. So, considering how it had that effect on you earlier, mm. you you were conscious of the fact that it would it would do that to you again. I didn't know, but I didn't want to fight it uh, because I felt that wouldn't be right either. So I just I hadn't looked at it really since I'd looked at it once more since this morning. I didn't read it out loud. I just read it. Um, yeah. Because you want to, you don't want to just indulge. You want to keep, keep it moving forward and everything. But it, but it does. It just it hits you because it's, because it's a great piece of writing which has been you know beautifully translated as well. So when you were reading it, are you living within the words itself, or are you drawing on your own feelings? Because we've all lost someone in our lives. Yeah, I mean, I guess. It's it's no one situation. It you know you do see maybe a whole gamut of faces that that, that, that one has lived through that with. But also um, there's, there's there's something about the universality of it, just knowing that other people have, you know, um, especially anyone who's lost a child, just knowing that that 
is happening out there all the time, really. That, 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 that has its own weight. Um, we have lots of questions coming in and, and not that much more time. So I know for Instagram Live, for instance, they have an hour, so we'll only have them for an hour, but we'll carry on a little while, hopefully, gentlemen, if you, if you can hang out with us for a little bit longer. Um, one question for you, Michael, is, is who do you identify with? In this story, um, I suppose mostly I'm the I'm the airman. Um, I've been a teacher all my life. Um, well, it's very strange. I started out as a little boy, as a little prince, if you like, um, and lived amongst teachers who did not inspire joy when I was very young. Um, and then grew into quite a young father. So I've always had children around me. Um, I have family with me at the moment and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And I spent all my life, um, I suppose, teaching and writing for children. But I'm now quite old. I'm 70 odd something. I don't want to go there, but I'm uh, old enough. And um, so I do see this thing from two perspectives. But if I'm honest, I hand on heart, I think I'm the pilot. I'm, I think. I'm the one trying to understand this, this boy. Um, and I'm the one who feels this extraordinary tenderness towards him. Um, you want to, he wants to protect him. He wants to understand him. And I suppose I've had it with uh, ch children in my own family and I've had children in, in class that they, they do sometimes say things which you know only children can say and they have great wisdom. And I'm not sure it's about innocence, it's about spontaneity somehow. And it's about vulnerability, that's, that's how they are. And it teaches you so much. And it's interesting, I did the translation of this when I was going through an illness and I had to be at home with treatment and stuff. And um, it was the most healing of books. You can't imagine to be sitting on your bed most of the time writing this, you forgot completely. Um, the concerns that you might have had, the anxieties. And it's because you were in the presence of a relationship of extraordinary honesty and tenderness and, and all the time. It, it's not sentimental. A lot of people think it's a sentimental book. It's not. It's a book that's truthful. And it, it's so rare to find a story that is that true. And I was in the business of climbing into saint Exupéry's mind and discovering this truth. And it was quite extraordinary and, and, and really healing. Tom, who do you identify with? Oh, well, the airman, I mean, um, I think, yeah, uh, the, 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 the little prince is, I mean, I guess there's, a, there's, there's that, you know, he's a kind of distillation of a, of a very particular part of oneself, the child that one tries to not, that one tries to not lose, but. Um, Are you conscious of that, trying not to lose that? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes one goes out of one's way to lose it because it can be, uh, you know, uh, overwhelming, or it can feel overwhelming because of, I guess, because of our culture. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I think uh, it, it's life is not much without that, really. Does your profession help keep that very much alive? Uh, <laughs> uh, you'd think. Um, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> it should. It should. It, it can do sometimes. I think. I. Uh, you know. Um, it, it, it. Not always. It can be a funny place. It can be a. It can be a sort of rather brutal place a lot of the time. Well, I, what I would say, Tom, is it. It certainly had that effect this afternoon. Oh. We could. There was. <laughs> there was no one who couldn't see the child in you, I think. Mm, good. No. Yeah. No, I th I do feel blessed to be in, to, to, you know, to be in a, a job that, that does sort of pull you in these different places. I think um, abandon is such an important uh, muscle for, for, for actors to kind of keep working. And um, it's easy, you know, it's, it's, it's not a muscle you naturally exercise. And, uh, yeah. Abandon in what sense? Um, sort of jumping in the middle of a circle and just being a bit of an idiot, you know, you don't 
which is which is tends to sort of come up a lot in the first week of rehearsal, particularly on anything that's you know got quite a, a sort of devised feel to it and um it's just easy oh you know a lot of a lot of times one makes a brilliant discovery because you know the director or a movement coach says you know can you do the scene again but as if you're i don't know uh you know it comes up with a totally bizarre thing and 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 there's sort of two voices in your head there's a bit of you going thank you for challenging me and there's another bit of bit of you going i don't know if i'm allowed to swear um uh, because you just think, no, I don't want to do that. I'm just, why, why are you make, asking me to, you know, be a, make an idiot of myself? But inevitably, and there's something about. I think abandon always. You can't have. You can't not have a profound experience if you abandon yourself to something. Of, of course, there are moments where one shouldn't, but um, it tends to a profound moment tends to follow because you're stepping outside of yourself in some way. Olivia, one of the questions that's come in says, it seems that the prince is the one taking care of the aviator, even after he decides he will leave, die. Yeah. And then the question says, what does it say about adult-children relationships? Well, it's, it's I think, first of all, it's, it's, it's a relation between us as a child and us as an adult. So the, the, the story of Little Prince is a meeting of Saint-Exupéry adult with himself as a child. And this meeting occurred really in the desert in 1936. He was lost, like he said in the book, you know, after a crash in the desert in, 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 between Libya and, Egyptia, and Egypt. And, and he, he really encountered this little fellow, you know, and, and, and as in, in his delirium, you know, because they were so thirsty and he thought he was to die with this me mechanician, uh, Mr. Prevo. So for himself, it's really a meeting with himself as a child. So it's, and the child will um, tell him about truths that he has forgotten, you know. So I think it's more this than relationship between adults and children, generally speaking. Um, uh, we can see what, and we all know what the result of loss is, but Michael and for Tom as well, what is the purpose of loss? Oh, Lord. Um, you, uh, you first, Tom. I was, uh, the phrase that me immediately came to mind was the playwright Edward Bond uh, uh, in one of his prologues, I think, said, um, not prologue, sorry, uh, prefaces, said, uh, we sacrifice life to destroy death. We can go out of our way to push death to the periphery. Um, and we, in the process of that, we somehow actually stop living. And uh, death is an integral part of life. Uh, it, it, it brings us into focus with what's important, actually. So I would say that. Mm. I think that's what's happening, interestingly. Sorry, Neil. I think that's what, what's what happening. What the heart is, 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 yeah. was it in the book? Yeah. Sorry, Michael. Karen. I was just going to say that I think, in, in a sense, that's what we're we're learning now. Um, I think, you know, everyone, everyone, but everyone, is having to confront uh, the reality of of death. We're reminded of it constantly, every every day. Um, we, it, you can't avoid it. And you have to deal with it, and that does allow you. It does allow you to uh, finally to to think past it. Um, and it's it's enlightening in a funny way, mm -hmm. and I think that's what a lot of people have found. It's, it's given us time uh, to think things through, um, and particularly as well, I have and many people have lost someone during the last few weeks and 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 months um, as part of it, and you know somehow. Uh, and the death wasn't any more or less important because of that, but you know it's going on everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And um, it's not just one death in one family or one friend. It is it is what happens to us, and we, we have to come to terms with that. And I think children, as they're growing up, it's very, very important earlier on um, that that this, this becomes not something they focus on and focus on, but something they begin to comprehend, you know, that there is... And they do it when they're very very young, you know, they'll pick a tadpole out of a, uh, out of a pond and, and keep it. And, 
and it may die. And they get to learn very, very early on that that is what happens. And bit by bit, it can be your grandpa, it can be your dog, it doesn't matter. It, it is somehow this understanding that this is what happens and you live your life. You don't spend your life worrying about death. It's not only about death. It's also about how you compensate the loss. When the, the little prince says, okay, I will be dead, you will be very sad, but you will see the stars and the, you will hear the star laughing. And so you will have a, a big compensation, so you will be consolate, because it's about consolation. And this, yeah. the power of this book is to consolate millions of people after a loss, as you said, husband, grandpa, a dog, a child. So it's a compensation. Mm. I think this is really uh, very strong in this book. What is, what do you think, Olivier? And same for you, Tom, and for Michael. Is the the overriding emotion you are left with when you finish reading *The Little Prince*? Olivier, I'll start with you as the grand nephew of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I mean, it's a miracle because you can read it hundreds of times. And you will feel the same emotion at the end of the book. So how can we explain that? I don't know. Of course, Tom is a fantastic actor. Thank you, Tom. You're a great actor. But even reading the book brings you this, this emotion. And yeah. I've, I read it millions of times. Yeah. The emotion, Tom? If you I, would... I think it's, I don't know what the emotion is when you say you feel healed. I mean, it, right. but it's like, it's like the drop of water, it's like the water in the desert. I mean, it's just... It's um, you feel healed. That's an amazing way of... It's appro approaching very important truths, you know, like... Or, or, the, the, um, meaning, the meaning of life. So it's quite, yeah. it's quite, it's quite dense. You know? Tom? I, I was just going to say, as much as healing is a process... You know, grieving is a process. Yeah. You do feel, you feel like you've started to. Because people say things like "let go," and it's like, okay, how do I do that? You know, and it's a, it's a process. And and the and the, the first part of it is letting yourself feel things. So, and that's I think what feels like the water in the desert, or the you know water coming out the well. It just there's a there's a release. It, it, it facilitates a huge emotional release. And Michael, as the man who sat there, not feeling particularly well, translating it, what was the, as you finished translating it, the emotion? I think it, in a funny way, what it does at the end, it, 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 you feel much more connected to the world about you um, when you've read this book. Um, you absolutely get what the fox is saying and the, how important the one rose is to look uh, to take deep breath, to think about things rather than to rush on. There's so much to say, but for me, it is this business of being connected to each other and focusing on that connection. Um, and I, I felt afterwards you know, that the, the, each of the people I meet on these planets, that in a, the, sometimes it's very, very brief and you're struggling to make some sort of connection. But that's why it's so wonderful. It's a very deft brushstroke that he uses. Uh, and at the end of it, I've, I feel as if I've met everyone in the world and I've been to every place in the world, mm -hmm. um, which is an extraordinary achievement in such a uh, su such a short book. So it is, yes, he, he's taught me a lot about uh, to make connections and to remain connected. Um, that with literature, with music, with life, with family, with friends, that is that is what we, we're here for, really. I have to say... Um... Tom and Olivier, we've been doing this since Monday, and it was Kristin Scott Thomas and Ben Okri and uh, Ruth Wilson and Jada Nuka, and then you today. And I have to say, Michael, every day you think to yourself when it's finished, how is this going to be taken to a different place the following day? And every yeah. single day. Yeah, absolutely. Really yeah, your voices, Tom. Um, Everyone involved has taken it to a completely different place. And it's just been an absolute honour to hear you read today, Tom, I have to say. It's been an absolute honour. Um, I hope all of you watching, wherever you've watched on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, have felt similarly throughout the week. Thank you for all of us joining us. And thank you so much to Alice Mazzili, who has been doing this incredible calligraphy each and every day. I haven't forgotten you, Alice. You were perhaps thinking, why hasn't he mentioned my name yet? 
Of course I haven't forgiven you. Uh, forgot you and I hope you haven't forgiven me. Uh, here we go. There is this beautiful calligraphy that she's been doing every single day and you can go and check out Alice Mazzili on Instagram and I strongly suggest you do that as well. Tom, thank you so much um, and I hope, when will we be seeing you on our screen? The question that we ask every actor at the moment and no one knows. Well, I think it's August 29th but I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that actually but I think it's around then. Okay. Um, late August. And, and is this the reason for your for your blonde hair? Uh, that was another job that was now on hold. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we look forward to it. You are absolute genius. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank, thank you, Tom Beck. Thank you, Tom. And Dege, thank you as well um, for being here today and providing context and history of what we're doing. And Michael Morpurgo, thank you so much for doing this. You know, it's been a pleasure. <clears throat> but uh, but actually, you know, it's after listening to Mozart. You know, you sh we always clap the orchestra or the violinist, and no one ever thanks Mozart. And I think we just have to thank Antoine de Saint Exupéry. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. À bientôt, j'espère. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you.